Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. I, your host, David Woodruff, call the Woodruff Report. I promise this is not going to become a habit. What do I mean by that? I'm recording. I am recording. I'm sorry. I'm recording again on a Saturday. Don't know what's going on. It's been a little hectic. And I just haven't been able to hit you up with any new content on Fridays. But don't worry. Your weekly podcast is coming right at you right now. So expect the schedule to be all back to normal. The podcast is not moving to Saturday. There have just been a couple fluke weeks that have happened to show up back to back. So this, this is a first for the Woodruff Report, this week's podcast. This is the first year that I'm doing it, and this is the first week there, where there has been no NFL football. And of course, NFL football has been a mainstay on this podcast, but I think this is kind of a blessing in disguise for the Woodruff Report because I get to talk about things that aren't football and show that this is not just a football podcast. This includes a lot. So, with that in mind, what am I coming at you with this podcast? Well, I'll tell you. Champions League. Round of 16 action has started. The first four fixtures went down. The second four fixtures fixtures will be on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Also, it is the All-Star break in the NBA, so we're going to do a little All-Star edition, NBA report, what's been going on. Who's in what playoff position? How have the good teams been playing? What are the major storylines? ETC, ETC. So, no football, but still a lot of good content. So, I'm your host, David Woodruff. This is the Woodruff Report, and we're going to get started in three, two, one. So, I haven't actually talked about the Champions League on this show yet, but... For any fans of this podcast who are unfamiliar with it, it is basically a league of the champions of all of Europe. So you've got the best teams from England, France, Germany, all of Europe's top major leagues, and some of the less popular ones like Russia and Ukraine, other games like that. Anyway, the best teams from all these leagues play each other in this league of champions, Very entertaining, a favorite of all soccer fans, including myself, because it puts the best competition up against each other. So, what were the games this week? Well, I'll tell you. First, we had Barcelona, longtime champions, huge success, major European powerhouse, going against PSG, the upstart Paris Saint-Germain team, who has really just gotten to this top level in recent years. Just le- like 10 years ago, they were bought by this very rich investment authority, and they've just had money pumped into the club. So they've been able to afford the top players. They have Edison Cavani, they had Zlatan Ibrahimovic for a little while, they've got Blaise Machuidi, they had David Luiz. Anyway, they've had some of the top talent in Europe, and they're only getting better. I mean, in these recent transfer windows, we've heard rumors that they're going after Lionel Messi, Neymar. They're going after the big names. They are for real. And they are consistent winners of France because other teams um, aren't able to get this kind of finance and pour that kind of money into the club. So PSG, really, they're their definition of success is based on their performance in the Champions League, not as much did they win the French Ligue 1. So anyway, Barcelona versus PSG in Paris turned out to be a pretty crazy game. What do I mean by that? Well, PSG actually won 4 nil. Yes, the mighty Barcelona was humbled at the hands of the quote-unquote upstart PSG team. So I was, I was able to watch a little bit of this game, and it really struck me that Barcelona's midfield just isn't as strong as, as, as it has been in recent years. I mean, we remember in those great teams under Pep Guardiola, they had Xavi and Iniesta in that midfield. And Iniesta's pretty old now. 
and he doesn't have the legs that he used to have. And they still haven't really found that, that Xavi replacement. Rakitic has been decent, but he actually wasn't playing. One of the puzzling decisions that their coach Luis Enrique made was he put in Andre Gomez to flank Iniesta in the midfield. So they were completely dominated by Marco Verratti, Blaise Matuidi, and company in that PSG midfield. And 4-0 might seem like a thrashing, but when you were watching it, it really it could have been even worse. So, absolutely incredible win for PSG. They look almost certain to qualify unless there's an absolute meltdown of epic, epic proportions in their second round game, which is in Barcelona. And, of course, I've learned through the years that you can never count Barcelona out. There was a chance late in the game for Barcelona to get a precious away goal. Away goals, I... um. I don't really have time to explain the whole away goal thing that happens in the Champions League game, so I suggest just looking up um, away goal rules Champions League if you want to learn a little bit more. So anyway, um, PSG looked certain to qualify, but Barcelona had a chance late in the game to make it 4-1 off a corner kick. PK headed it back across and set across, and Samuel Umtiti hit the crossbar slash post area, the post where the crossbar meshes with the post from like a yard away, an absolute howler. And it really, I think that was the final nail in the coffin of Barcelona. So this is going to be their earliest exit in a while, round of 16, if results hold and if results pan out as they are expected to. In other games, we'll stick in Spain with other Spanish giants, Real Madrid, as Napoli visited the Santiago Bernabeu. Real Madrid saw them off 3-1 in what was a thrilling game. Napoli scored first, securing a precious away goal as a through ball was played through, and Napoli's Lorenzo Insigni hit an absolutely brilliant curling strike as he saw uh, Real Madrid keeper Kaylor Navas off his line, curling it in from about 35 yards out. Absolutely incredible goal. And that, that was big. I mean, Napoli's now up 1-0, has the away goal, and holders Real Madrid are in some trouble, which they promptly took care of. Karim Benzema made the score level with a brilliant header. Actually, really, the cross was more brilliant than the finish was. Outside of the boot cross, wonderful. Benzema had little to do, just head it down, make sure he doesn't hit it directly at the goalkeeper. That's what he did. 1-1. Tony Cruz then made it 2-1 off a Ronaldo cutback from the byline. Tony Cruz slots it near post to make it 2-1. And then Casemiro gave Real a very important goal with a brilliant volley. Even This goal was even better than the... Uh, than the Insigni goal, which is saying a lot. Just ball is deflected out, one-time volley, far corner. My words can't describe it. I suggest looking it up on the internet. So (laughs) after you look up away goal rule, you should look up Casemiro goal versus Napoli. Absolutely incredible. Worth your time. Absolutely. So 3-1 was the final. Dries Mertens had a chance late in this game to make it 3-2 for Napoli, which would have been huge because a 1-0 win in, um, in Napoli would secure a win. But now Napoli must beat Real 2-0 or by 3-1, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with the whole away goal rule. So it gets complicated. Anyway, Napoli, Napoli looks certain, certain to crash out. They gave it a good, a good go, but Real Madrid are just, are just cruising this year. It's going to be tough for anyone to stop them. So, moving away from Spanish teams, Benfica hosted Borussia Dortmund in a great match in the Estadio Dragao in Portugal. So, this was, a, this was a tighter game, less goals all around, and Benfica actually came up on top with a tight 1-0 win. Mitroglou scored the winning goal off a corner kick, Barely cleared off the line, and he just poked it in. It was virtually on the goal line. A mean deflection. Absolutely juked out the Dortmund keeper. And all he had to do was poke it into the net. 
This was a great game, a good result for Benfica, but it's going to be tough to have to go to the Signal Iduna Park in Dortmund, face the yellow wall, and come out with a good result. So I see the only way I see Benfica progressing is if they played maybe a nil-nil game. They just put numbers behind the ball, frustrate Dortmund, don't allow them to score. If Dortmund is able to score early in the return fixture, I see Benfica crashing out because Dortmund have a lot of quality. I mean, Aubameyang is almost guaranteed a goal per game with the way he's been playing this season. But great win in at home for Benfica coming out on top 1-0. The last game involved an English team. Arsenal went to Germany to play Bayern Munich, and in retrospect, they probably wish they had never came. Bayern Munich with a 5-1 thrashing of Arsene Wenger's side. More calls for Wenger's job after this poor performance, but that's a whole nother story. They've been calling for his job for like the last 100 years and nothing's been done about it. Anyway, don't get me started on that. But Lewandowski and company looked great. They looked menacing. Osil, 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 and Alexis Sanchez couldn't do anything. This was another game similar to the Barcelona PSG game where Bayern just completely annihilated Arsenal in the midfield area. Arsenal didn't look like they had their legs under them. Their midfield wasn't able to press, wasn't able to stay with. Aryan Robin scored very early in this game, a brilliant curling effort. He cut in on his favorite left foot and hit a beautiful curler into the top corner. Nothing Ospina could do. The score was actually leveled when Alexis Sanchez converted a um, converted a penalty won by Laurent Koscielny after it was kind of a weird penalty. Lewandowski was trying to clear the ball. He was going to volley it out of the danger area. And Koscielny comes and kind of nicks it away from him at the last possible second. And Lewandowski, his foot that was going to hit the ball, hits Koscielny's foot. And Koscielny goes flying on the ground, acting like he just got shot. Referee points to the spot. And the initial penalty was actually saved by Neuer. But on the follow-up, Sanchez was able to stay with it and keep his composure and place it in. So it was 1-1 for a little while, and then the the Bavarians took over and absolutely throttled Arsenal. Another, another point to add to the whole English teams never do well in the Champions League thing, and another argument to put against the uh, uh, Premier League is the best league in the world. How can you say that when its best teams are getting throttled by other teams? But that's also another story. I keep trying to do other stories for some reason. But anyway, what I'm trying to get to, Bayern Munich thrashed Arsenal 5-1 and also looks certain to go through. So really the only tight return fixture looks to be the Benfica versus Dortmund game as the others look o- look look over. All the home teams won, which is not all that uncommon in the Champions League. Home field advantage is huge especially with those packed houses and the banners being unfurled and the chants and the the atmospheres are just amazing in the Champions League and that's another reason why it's such a good league. So that's my Champions League roundup. Let's move up. Let's move on, I should say, to a NBA All-Star break recap. What's going on? Who's good? Who's not? What's the playoff situation look like, etc. So I'm going to start in the Western Conference with my boys, the Golden State Warriors. They are looking fantastic at the moment, 47-9, and nine, and currently four games ahead of the second-place San Antonio Spurs. So the Western Conference has a bunch of very good teams. You've got the Warriors and the Spurs. You've also got the Rockets, Clippers, Grizzlies, uh, Jazz. I always forget about the Jazz. Shout out to Utah. You have a great team this year. But other than that, it's really a, a crapshoot at the especially the eighth playoff spot, is coming down to a huge race between a bunch of teams, including the Nuggets, the Trailblazers, the Kings, whom I, the Pelicans. All those teams don't have good records, but there's really a steep drop-off between the top 
of the Western Conference and the bottom. The Thunder are also in there. They're in the they're in the seven spot right now. They're looking a little shaky, but it looks as though they'll be able to keep that place based on the, how they've been playing this season. Anyway, the eight the eight seed is the one that's really up for grabs. So whoever wins that is just going to probably get swept by the Warriors anyway. So, but playoffs is always fun especially for young teams such as the Nuggets. I'm personally rooting for them to kind of get that eight spot or the Kings just because I like to see Boogie DeMarcus Cousins succeed. I always feel so bad for him because he's surrounded by such bad players. Anyway, but the Nuggets with Jokic and company, it's going to be great for them to see the playoffs, get some experience because they're going to be a possible juggernaut as we uh, continue. Um... At the other end of the spectrum, the Suns and the Lakers are currently at the foot of the standings. Both teams have some good young pieces, though, so this is not absolutely hopeless like we'll see in the Eastern Conference with the New Jersey Nets. It's not completely hopeless. The Suns have Devin Booker. He's looked absolutely incredible, and he's so young. It's incredible how young he is. The Lakers have, of course, all those young pieces, D'Angelo Russell, Julius Randle, and they'll only improve. They still they need a bunch of pieces, but they're trending in the right direction. So moving on to the Eastern Conference, which is much more tight at the top and also very competitive in, with those in-the-hunt playoff teams similar to the West. So the Cavs lead the way, but they are only three games above the Boston Celtics led by Isaiah Thomas. What a season he's had. The Washington Wizards are also clicking. They're only about five games back of the Cavs. John Wall, Bradley Beal, they're really, they're finally starting to play the way they've been predicted to play by experts for the last like four, three or four years. It's been great to see John Wall slashing, Bradley Beal shooting, and Otto Porter's been playing great. And it's been, it's been what we've expected from the Wizards. It's just come later. I mean, they were projected not to do very well because we'd all been warned, oh, we always rate the Wizards too high. So we kind of lowballed them, and now they've been playing great. So maybe that tells you something about the team. Maybe it doesn't. I don't really know. The Raptors are also in their seven games back of the Cavs. And then in the hunt again for that eighth playoff seed, the Pistons, Bucks, the Hornets, the Heat, all those teams hoping to get a shot at the Cavs, or even maybe improve, maybe get that seven seed. So it's, it's going to be an interesting final, final half of the season after the All-Star break, just because there's not as much parity in the league as there's been before. In both the East and the West, there's, kind of a, there's a big drop-off between the, the cream of the crop and kind of the rest of the barrel. And so it's going to be interesting to see these maybe teams that are below 500 battle for that eighth seed. And it's going to set up some crazy good games down the stretch. It's going to set up sort of those regular season playoff games, if you will, where it has the crazy playoff environment because whoever wins has a, really a shot at making the playoffs. So I'm glad. I mean, I'm all for it. I love competition. I love those playoff during the regular season games, and I can't wait to see the second half of the season play out. So, this has been the Woodruff Report. The one talking at you has been David Woodruff. And what did we talk about today? Well, we gave you a Champions League roundup, and we gave you a little NBA All-Star break roundup also. So, thanks for tuning in. This has been David Woodruff. Watch those Champions League games next week. We've got some good ones. Also look up the away goals rule and look up Casemiro's volleyed goal. And while you're at it, while you're on the internet, you might as well just watch the Lorenzo Insigne goal too. This has been the Woodruff Report. This has been your host, David Woodruff. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time on Friday. On Friday, I promise. Actually, I don't really promise. I don't pinky promise, but I pretty much promise. Anyway, goodbye. Thanks for tuning in.